especialista em tecnologia e telecomunicações, ele trabalhou por mais de duas décadas como assessor no Congresso dos Estados Unidos e na Comissão Federal de Comunicações. Atualmente, ocupa um dos principais cargos no Twitter e, em visita ao Brasil, tratou de medidas destinadas a evitar o uso da rede para a divulgação das chamadas fake news. Nesse sentido, o Twitter acumulou experiência em recentes eleições na França, Alemanha, Coreia do Sul e México e espera utilizar esse conhecimento para garantir a utilização adequada da plataforma nas eleições no Brasil. O vice-presidente de políticas públicas do Twitter, Colin Crowell, é o convidado de hoje do Roda Viva. Bem-vindos a mais este Roda Viva, o mais tradicional programa de entrevistas da TV brasileira. Hoje, como convidado, o vice-presidente de políticas públicas do Twitter, Colin Crowell. Estamos no ar em todo o país, pela TV Cultura, pelas emissoras afiliadas, pelo nosso canal no YouTube e pela nossa página no Facebook. Para conversar com Colin Crowell, convidamos... Fernanda Romano, sócia e diretora de criação da consultoria Malagueta. Letícia Picoloto, fundadora da ONG Brasil Lab. Natália Neres, pesquisadora e coordenadora da área de desigualdades e identidades no Internet Lab. Patrícia Blanco, presidente do Instituto Palavra Aberta. E Juliano Speyer, antropólogo, pesquisador da empresa Alexandria Big Data e autor do livro Mídias Sociais no Brasil Emergente. E somos acompanhados pelo nosso cartunista, o intraduzível Paulo Caruso, com desenhos feitos em tempo real. Bem-vindo, muito obrigado por ter vindo aqui ao nosso programa. Colin, eu tenho algumas rápidas perguntas é, sobre a, a importância do Twitter. Qual a importância de um programa, por exemplo, estar em primeiro lugar no Twitter? Uh, boa noite. Boa noite. Obrigado. Thank you for having me as a uh, guest tonight. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Uh, the importance of Twitter Uh, has grown obviously over time. Uh, the importance of Twitter uh, for uh, uh, culture and television programming and uh, certainly shows like this is uh, it allows people to interact uh, in real time with the show as it's airing. Uh, and oftentimes the, the uh, content uh, is amplified and augmented uh, uh, because of shows like this that create content that people want to have conversations about. Uh, in real time uh, there. But to be important on Twitter uh, uh, means uh, that you're participating in a conversation. Our mission as a company is to serve that public uh, conversation. E uh, o fato, por exemplo, do programa ter estado no primeiro lugar nos, nos trends mundiais do Twitter e também nos trends mundiais de busca do Google, uh, as empresas buscam isso? As personalidades buscam isso? I think one of the things that uh, both uh, media companies and personalities, uh, celebrities, sports stars, uh, they're trying to reach people and trying to have conversations with people. And Twitter brings uh, people uh, to them and brings their voice back to people. And so the importance is the ability to speak directly to your followers, the ability to speak directly to people and engage in conversation with them about uh, issues of relevance and things that are important uh, to you. So certainly uh, a, a show or a media company that has a lot of engagement and a lot of conversations that it provokes on, on Twitter is serving a public interest uh, purpose in uh, allowing people to interact uh, with content in that way. Vamos começar a nossa rodada de entrevistadores aqui com a Natália. Primeiro você, Natália, por favor. É, boa noite. É, eu gostaria de começar com, com um tema que tomou conta da, dos debates na, nas últimas semanas, é, que tem a ver com a acusação de alguns grupos conservadores de que o Twitter estaria censurando seus discursos. né? É uma hashtag que foi trend tam, também nos últimos tempos foi a direita mordaçada. Né? E, bom, depois de toda a, a polêmica, uma última entrevista sua, é, 
deu alguns esclarecimentos sobre alguns pontos. O primeiro é de que as contas não teriam sido excluídas do, do Twitter, né? O fato é que elas se mantêm é, na plataforma e elas foram desafiadas né, a cederem número de telefone para que para confirmar mesmo sua veracidade, enfim. Ocorre que esse esclarecimento foi feito depois, né? E o campo progressista, né, é, diante dessa informação também, acho que ficou um pouco preocupado, né, na medida que agentes, né, pessoas que trabalham com direitos humanos, com agendas do movimento negro, LGBT, também pensou, se esses discursos são censurados, os nossos também vão ser, né. É, diante desse contexto, dessas últimas polêmicas, minha primeira pergunta seria... É, por que que, primeiro, por que, que nós temos mais notícias de ações desse tipo direcionadas ao campo conservador e ao campo da direita? E se a empresa tem pensado em estabelecimento de critérios um pouco mais claros ou um jeito de comunicar melhor ações desse tipo? Né? Depois ficou um pouco mais claro o que tinha acontecido, mas até o, a sua entrevista, eu acho que a sociedade civil brasileira ficou um pouco assustada com a possibilidade de censuras de discurso tanto à direita quanto à esquerda. Uh, thank you, Natalia, uh, for the question. I appreciate it. Uh, it, it certainly, uh, as a platform, uh, that's an open public platform for speech, uh, we want to make sure that we have diverse perspectives uh, and we have the ability of everybody who has an opinion and a viewpoint to be present. Uh, because uh, ultimately that benefits all Twitter users uh, to get those uh, diverse opinions and perspectives. And uh, in headlong pursuit of making sure that we're creating a very healthy platform uh, for uh, conversation, uh, we're taking action on uh, content increasingly to deal with some of the vulnerabilities that the uh, uh, service had uh, exhibited previously, and one of those was uh, with respect to malicious automation. And we've made significant progress in addressing uh, malicious automation. Uh, we now are removing 214% uh, more uh, spammy uh, accounts uh, now than we were a year ago. But one thing that uh, we do, even as we leverage machine learning and use technology to help us solve some of the problems that technology itself poses for us, uh, we're not always sure that an account is uh, automated or perhaps human driven. And in those instances, uh, what we do is we challenge those accounts as you described, and we prompt users to provide a recapture code or a phone number uh, in order to restore them to full functionality. We never censor accounts when we do this, uh, but we do limit their functionality. Uh, a year ago, uh, September of last year, we were challenging about 3.2 million accounts a week. Today, you know, as of uh, May or June, we were challenging 9.9 .9 million accounts a week. So globally, we're going to have uh, a process where we uh, challenge these accounts to, to provide that. The technology that we use for machine learning to challenge accounts that are exhibiting some spam-like behavior that uh, we want to investigate does not look at the content of any tweet. That's an important factor and something that we believe reinforces free expression. We look instead at the behavioral characteristics of the account. We look at how it's behaving on the platform, the conduct of the account to see if it's exhibiting spam-like behavior. And then we, uh, 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 the, the uh, mechanism prompts uh, that challenge. No human being decides which accounts get challenged. No accounts are challenged on the basis of political views or political viewpoints. Uh, but this is all in headlong pursuit of creating a platform uh, that will be healthier uh, and have fewer of uh, these spam-like uh, accounts uh, present on the platform. Fernanda. É, eu queria, na verdade, fazer um contraponto à Natália. É, você, você falou que... Obrigada por estar aqui, de qualquer forma. É, você falou que vocês é, não, não censuram, e, e, mas gostariam de ter uma plataforma saudável. E, no entanto, é, essa semana 
o, a Apple, o Facebook, o YouTube e o Spotify baniram o Alex Jones, que é um extremista de direita americano, uma pessoa que tem um comportamento bastante é, controverso e que fala mentiras e usa o Twitter como uma das suas principais plataformas. Eles baniram o Alex Jones das suas, das suas plataformas e o Twitter decidiu não banir. Não só o Twitter não baniu, como o Jack Dorsey fez um statement e entre uma, algumas das coisas que ele falou, ele, fa ele colocou no Twitter dele, e eu vou fazer uma tradução, eu não sou tradutora juramentada, então pode ser que eu não, não faça justiça, mas... Pode utilizar também, Fernando. É. Tá? Contas como a de Jones podem muitas vezes sensacionalizar, criar, né, fazer sensacionalismo com assuntos e espalhar rumores que não têm fundamentação. Então, é crítico que os jornalistas documentem, validem e refutem essas informações diretamente para que as pessoas formem suas próprias opiniões. Isso é o que serve a, 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 conversa, a conversa do público, é, isso é o que melhor serve a conversa do público. Ou seja, o Jack Dorsey devolveu o job para os jornalistas. Né? Isso não me parece uma atitude correta. Então, eu queria muito entender, eu moro nos Estados Unidos, eu, eu assisto alguns absurdos dessas pessoas que acreditam que Sandy Hook, por exemplo, não aconteceu. Eu trabalhei com uma pessoa que perdeu um sobrinho em Sandy Hook. Então, eu queria muito entender qual é a lógica do Twitter para não banir o Alex Jones. Sandy Hook, é, dá uma explicada. Aquela escola... Aquela escola onde é, mataram... Aquela escola no, a norte de Nova York, onde um rapaz desequilibrado entrou e, entrou e, matou, e matou 18 é. crianças. E o Alex Jones disse que não só não aconteceu, como ele pratica a perseguição ativa às famílias das, da, que perderam as crianças. E hoje tem notícias em todos os as publicações americanas falando que o advogado dele está tentando é, uma, in uma injunction, uma, um processo para publicar os endereços dessas pessoas, para as pessoas poderem ir lá é, atacar essas famílias. Uhum. E uma das plataformas que ele usa é o, é Twitter. o Twitter. Thank you, Fernanda. Uh, it's uh, certainly a timely question. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, Twitter as a technology evolves over time. And Twitter's policies also evolve over time. Uh, come September, I'll have been at Twitter seven years. And when I started at Twitter, Twitter was 140 characters and a link. And if you click the link, it took you somewhere else. Now we're 280 characters and increasingly, uh, from a technology standpoint, uh, it's more feature rich, uh, more media integrations, live broadcasting uh, is there. So as the technology evolves, so do our policies over time. And uh, what uh, our CEO Jack Dorsey explained in his tweets and what has also been explained by our head of trust and safety, which is the part of Twitter that enforces uh, our, our safety rules, uh, is that uh, simply because somebody uh, has violated rules on another platform, on another social media service, does not necessarily mean that the same individual has violated Twitter's rules. Secondly, uh, tweets in the past that might not, that uh, did not violate the rules in the past uh, may violate the rules today because our safety rules have evolved. And so some of the tweets that are cited uh, from the account in question uh, from the past weren't violative of Twitter's rules at that time. But Twitter's rules has, have uh, evolved and they may be in violation of rules would they be renewed at this time. Secondly, if uh, Alex Jones or any other Twitter user violates the rules, we'll enforce the rules uh, as appropriate. Uh, and that's something that uh, we want to make sure that we're doing uh, promptly uh, and making sure that we're clearer about what those rules are over time so people understand uh, the boundaries. But if Uh, a user has not violated our rules. It would be wrong in our view to respond to public pressure uh, to uh, suspend somebody who's not in violation of our rules. And so even as the rules evolve, uh, we're going to apply the rules uh, and the safety rules that, that are there to make sure that we're uh, addressing the rules that are, that are appropriate. Now, people can critique the rules. Uh, people may say that the rules are lacking Uh, and the rules should be uh, improved and refined and recalibrated. And I think that's something that we're constantly looking at. And I think certainly uh, this conversation, which has broken out uh, over this, is certainly going to prompt 
uh, a very close look at our rules to ascertain what is appropriate uh, in, the, in the current environment with respect to uh, content of this type. The second point uh, that you mentioned uh, is a good one, which is uh, what is the role of Twitter uh, and what is the role of journalism? And uh, one way to think about this, and certainly the way we think about it, is that it has always been the role of journalism and journalists uh, in a democracy uh, to be the truth tellers. It has always been the role of journalists to hold public officials accountable. Uh, for our part, we don't believe as a company that we should be the arbiters of the truth. We think particularly, and here in Brazil, you're in an election context, we don't believe it's the appropriate role of a company to decide whether a certain political statement is accurate or inaccurate or truthful or false. Uh, that's the role of journalists. What our role is in that context is really about elevating the visibility of healthy, informationally nutritious content from news media, from journalists and others who can bring context, who can validate or refute uh, the content that's out there. The good news about having an open platform such as Twitter, uh, and certainly the fact that Twitter has so many journalists who engage in that corrective in real time, uh, means that the openness itself can be a very powerful antidote uh, to the spreading of fabrications. Eu, eu posso só uma réplica? Você falou em elevar uma conversa mais saudável. O Twitter eleva uma conversa não saudável quando eleva o Alex Jones, quando eleva o Donald Trump ameaçando bombardear a Coreia do Norte. E, e porque alguém mudou o user handle para Elon Musk, a conta dele é bloqueada. Então, eu faço uma piada e mudo meu user handle para Elon Musk, vocês bloqueiam a conta. O Donald Trump ameaça bombardear a Coreia, o Alex Jones conta mentiras e incita a violência, que até onde eu me lembre é uma das regras do Twitter, não pode incitar a violência. E eles não só são elevados, porque o algoritmo diz que eles têm muitas, muitos views, e aí é um dos critérios do algoritmo, né? quanto mais famoso, mais aparece relevante. Como... Então, assim, eu tenho muita dificuldade de entender, porque essa regra não é, ela é um pouco cinza, ela não me parece preta no branco. Nós uh, would endeavor Uh, Fernanda, to be more transparent and more open about how we uh, make these decisions. And that's something that I think uh, we've been improving on over the last year or so, uh, and we're certainly going to uh, make more efforts there. Uh, one of the things that we want to do, as Twitter has migrated from being a strictly chronological uh, platform to one that does use algorithms, Uh, to uh, rank uh, in part these conversations and in particular search results is to make sure that we're taking into account the context that I hope uh, users would expect us to take into account. So for example, when you uh, tweet something, uh, the responses that you probably would like to see to your tweet come from people you follow, from verified accounts, Uh, or from accounts that have lots of followers, because that would be the type of engage engagement you'd naturally like to see. Accounts that you don't follow, that may not have many followers, that may have people who mute them or block them on Twitter, uh, are probably ones that, uh, from a visibility standpoint, are less important for you to see. They'll still be present if you want to see them, but we will rank them in that uh, kind of hierarchy, and that's part of the process that uh, we're engaging in. And, and I agree, we could do a better job in explaining uh, to people how that all uh, works. Uh, but the, the, the other uh, issue you mentioned with respect to uh, threats of violence, uh, certainly threats of violence are ones that we want to make sure are dealt with Uh, for individual users, and we take uh, those uh, threats seriously, and we do have uh, policies in place to, to address those. There is a difference uh, with respect to a head of state, uh, with respect to uh, content that they may be tweeting to their constituents that reflect their views on a foreign policy issue. And uh, the President of the United States would not be the first world leader who threatened military action as part of Uh, the exercise of foreign policy. Certainly isn't the first U.S. president to do that, and certainly not the first U.S. president with respect to the country that was named. Now, the president may use Twitter instead of using 
uh, television or, or radio, uh, and the president may use more col colorful language uh, in doing that and provocative uh, language. That's certainly his style. But the exercise of foreign policy in a tweet like that, uh, we believe there's a public interest consideration so that people see what the president is thinking in real time and can react and engage with it, that journalists see in real time what the president is proposing and thinking and can give context around that in real time. And when uh, the president uh, does a tweet like that, there are also opposition party leaders in Congress who can react in real time and other elected officials can uh, engage in that conversation. And certainly uh, there, there uh, will be uh, proposals to constrain uh, the power of the president in part because of uh, the content that he's uh, tweeting. And those proposals are in uh, the Congress today with respect to the exercise of uh, foreign policy and military intervention, but also with respect, for example, to uh, 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 removing the United States from NATO, for example. So the ability to have a public interest consideration for a world leader's content to be shared with uh, his constituents uh, but also with the world, is something that we uh, understand uh, people may find the language provocative. They may not agree uh, with his policy positions. Uh, but certainly knowing what the president is thinking and seeing that in real time is something that I, I think has some value. Patricia, por favor. Sem réplica. Sem réplica. <laughs> Como, é, se esse é um dos objetivos, elevar o discurso, tornar a rede né, a, mais saudável, como fazer isso sem entrar no conteúdo ou sem controlar esse conteúdo? O Twitter é, é conhecido por não, entra, por não entrar nesses conteúdos. Como elevar esse, esse ambiente, torná-lo mais saudável e, ao mesmo tempo, é, é, tentar diminuir essa profusão, essa proliferação do discurso de ódio, de segregação e até mesmo de, de violência, como a Thank you, Patricia. Um, I appreciate the question. Uh, the context here is that in headlong pursuit of striking the right balance between freedom of expression while also making sure that we have a platform that is healthy where people don't feel abused uh, into uh, a position where they feel si silenced. Uh, because if there's uh, abuse and harassment on the platform and somebody feels uh, so abused that they refrain from tweeting, that hurts freedom of expression as well. And so what we have found is that the best strategy for Twitter uh, to uh, address some of the content that is a vehicle uh, for some of the uh, problems on the platform, whether it's misinformation, whether it's harassment or abuse, uh, typically comes from a vector of these um, automated accounts. Uh, and we learned this uh, lesson over time using uh, technology and using machine learning. I'll just, as an aside, uh, give you an example of what we did with respect to our work in counterterrorism. So three, four years ago, it was certainly the case that of uh, the various terrorist groups around the world, ISIS was a terrorist group that was quite sophisticated in the use of social media. And they certainly had Twitter accounts. And one of the things that they uh, did is that they had created these automated accounts that they would use to uh, disseminate their propaganda and information uh, about their attacks. And they would celebrate terrorism. And so we wanted to make sure that we were addressing uh, that issue, which is a very serious issue. And over the last three years, we've removed about uh, over a million accounts on Twitter related to terrorism. But three years ago, when we were addressing those issues, about 25% of the accounts that we removed were identified using technology. That number today is 95% of the accounts we're removing uh, is due to technology. Uh, and 75% of that 95 uh, are accounts that we remove before they can do their first tweet. Now, how do we do that? We don't do it by looking at the content, because what we found was simply because you tweet about an ISIS attack in Arabic and you have an Arabic surname doesn't mean you're a terrorist. In many cases, we got false positives because people uh, like that might be Al Jazeera journalists who are reporting on, on ISIS. Mm. 
uh, as sophisticated as the technology is in a uh, character constrained platform like Twitter, uh, the sentiment analysis, if we were looking at content, might not pick up sarcasm uh, or mockery. And certainly encountering violent extremism and counter narratives, sometimes the use of sarcasm or, or, or mockery is, is used there. And so we learn to look at the behavioral characteristics of the accounts around account formation, contact emails, various other indicators that told the machine as the machine learning uh, got better and more refined uh, that these accounts were likely uh, returning accounts uh, that have been blocked before from similar origin uh, and we've made significant strides in that so that we uh, now take that kind of learning about the accounts uh, and looking at behavioral characteristics so that we are dispassionate and not looking at the content of these accounts so that we respect free expression and are just looking at those behaviors. A gente vai ter que fazer o intervalo e a gente continua com a roda, certamente essa questão da liberdade de expressão, limites, como atingir esse equilíbrio é um dos grandes temas da internet hoje. A gente vai voltar daqui a pouquinho é, e já já com o vice-presidente de políticas públicas globais do Twitter, Colin Crowell. Voltamos já. Estamos de volta com o vice-presidente de Políticas Públicas Globais do Twitter, Colin Crowell. Estávamos falando no bloco anterior da questão do encontrar o equilíbrio sobre liberdade de expressão e onde realmente cortar contas, não cortar contas. Vamos continuar nesse assunto com a Letícia Picoloto. Boa noite, Colin. É, o Twitter recentemente desativou 200 contas ligadas a operadores russos é, e está contribuindo com as, as investigações também a respeito da influência da Rússia nas eleições americanas. Como você sabe, aqui no Brasil a gente vai ter eleições presidenciais agora em outubro, então eu queria saber o que, que o Twitter está fazendo a respeito disso para que não ocorra no Brasil a mesma coisa que aconteceu nos Estados Unidos. Thank you, Leticia. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm here in part because of the election uh, period that uh, Brazil finds itself in. And certainly Twitter is eager to support uh, the work of uh, the election commission here uh, in Brazil. Uh, we're working very closely to make sure we're in contact with the election commission and the electoral courts where we have a, uh, a specified way for them to reach us in timely fashion with any issues that are arising uh, here in Brazil. Uh, certainly when Twitter started, uh, concerns about foreign interference uh, were not things that uh, we needed to worry about. But obviously, as history has progressed and as we've seen uh, from the 2016 US election, uh, it's certainly something that we have to be wary of uh, and taking appropriate uh, measures to make sure that we limit uh, some of the uh, uh, problems that may arise. Uh, we've been working since 2016 in elections uh, around the world. So last year there were elections in France, in Germany, in Korea. We most recently had an election uh, in Mexico on July 1st. And the good news is that uh, certainly in the case uh, with Mexico, uh, we had uh, the policies and practices in place and the relationships established in the country uh, to make sure that we weren't uh, running into uh, issues uh, where malicious automation, uh, which is the primary vector for attempts to manipulate uh, the Twitter platform, were present. Uh, we're going to have uh, a similar uh, uh, playbook here uh, for Brazil. Uh, we will have uh, stepped up uh, uh, and appropriate uh, uh, policies in place and personnel in place at Twitter uh, to make sure that we can respond in a moment uh, when we will certainly see an increase uh, in Twitter engagement uh, on the platform here in Brazil. But uh, we're very optimistic about the uh, steps that we've taken and we've put in place here uh, in Brazil. And we will be uh, alive to any issues that uh, arise to make sure that we can respond quickly. Oh, Juliana. Eu queria aproveitar a pergunta que a Letícia fez agora e, entender, e pedir para você explicar para o brasileiro comum 
não para a pessoa que é familiarizada com tecnologia, quais são os problemas que podem acontecer e que aconteceram em outras eleições em relação ao uso dessa ferramenta e o que, na prática, é, a sua companhia, a companhia que você representa, está fazendo para essas eleições é, para que isso não aconteça aqui? Thank you, Giuliano. Uh, I appreciate uh, the question. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we want to make sure uh, occurs in an election like this, first and foremost, is that people feel that when they are receiving information from an elected uh, official, from a candidate, from a political party, that they feel like they're getting the authentic uh, information from those sources. And so we go through a process and we're, we work very closely with elected officials, with the political parties and the candidates to make sure that their Twitter accounts are verified, to, uh, to make sure that we have uh, direct lines of communication, that they can uh, reach out to us with any issues that are arising. Uh, one of the things that we would be concerned about in any election is a Twitter account that is impersonating uh, a candidate uh, and perhaps putting out information that doesn't reflect Uh, the views of the candidates. So we want to make sure that we're dealing uh, with those issues of impersonation, uh, and that's why we have this verification process uh, in point as well. Uh, we also want to make sure as we go through uh, any, any campaign and electoral uh, uh, engagement in any country uh, that uh, the Twitter platform isn't manipulated. And in the past, we have seen attempts uh, to ma manipulate our trending topics, which are the topics and subjects of conversation on Twitter that has seen the, the greatest acceleration of engagement and conversation on the platform. And certainly, we want to make sure that uh, the topics that are in the trending topics uh, reflect the organic, authentic conversation of Brazilians around these issues. So attempts to manipulate uh, those processes and those uh, attributes of the platform would be the ones that we would be most concerned about and the ones that we would want to make sure that we are taking the extra steps and extra efforts uh, to make sure that uh, they are as healthy uh, and as authentic uh, as possible. Kalen, ainda neste ainda nesse assunto, um levantamento aqui do do laboratório que a Natália trabalha disse que 37% dos seguidores do Twitter dos pré-candidatos à presidência são robôs. O Twitter tem como detectar isso se uh, as mensagens estão sendo disparadas por robôs e tem como bloquear isso? Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, one of the things that uh, we see, particularly around election uh, periods uh, in, in many countries, is that we have people who are new, who join Twitter in part because an election is happening and because they want to see Uh, accounts uh, from uh, the candidates and they want to see information about the issues uh, in the election. One of the things that uh, we see in a lot of the academic research uh, around uh, uh, Twitter, because Twitter is so open and public, we tend to get more academic research uh, directed at us, uh, is that uh, people get to look at public signals. And we, all, we often look at the methodology Uh, that people look at to look at those public signals. Now, the fact that that's what they have available to look at makes sense, and so they're, they're looking at that. Twitter is able to look at internal signals. We're, lo we're able to look at uh, signals with respect to account uh, creation. Oftentimes, when people are looking for bots, uh, they might look at an account that doesn't have a, a picture for the avatar on the account or a profile pic. Uh, they may not tweet that often. Uh, they may not have that many followers. And if they engage in a political tweet or something like that, or follow a candidate, somebody looking at that account might say, that's a bot. Now, an account with those attributes also describes my mother's account, uh, because she still hasn't uh, found a picture she likes well enough to put on the uh, profile. Uh, she doesn't tweet very much. She doesn't follow a lot of people, although she does follow me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what we find oftentimes is that when we look at Uh, accounts, uh, we certainly will find some automated accounts. We tend to find fewer uh, than many of the uh, outside researchers find, and there's a reason for that. If you recall earlier, I mentioned that we challenge 
9.9 million accounts a week that we suspect of being bots but may not be bots. And so even as we challenge those accounts, we remove them from the ability to tweet, we remove them from search results, and we diminish their visibility on the platform. We have what is referred to as an open API, which is just computer speak for the ability of uh, journalists and outside researchers to get a glimpse of Twitter data and take a dip into Twitter data to do some analysis through this open aperture, this open uh, data possibility through our open API. All of the things that we're doing to fight spam and all the mitigation efforts that we make to reduce the visibility, limit the tweeting, remove from search results are not reflected in that public API. So people who are looking at it from outside see those accounts as if they're still active on the platform. And they'll see accounts that they believe are still bot-like that are not necessarily there. <clears throat> the additional thing that I'll say with respect to political accounts in particular, in addition to the fact that we see a lot of new registrations uh, on Twitter uh, uh, during times of elections, is that uh, if there's a political campaign that's well organized, if there's a party that's well organized, uh, it often will encourage its supporters uh, to follow them on social media, whether that's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or any. If it's a well-organized political party, typically what it will also do is it will suggest to its partisan followers, here's the message of the day. The message of the day is on education reform. Here's the message, please share this on social media. Now, a well-organized political party in a particular, uh, particularly large country may email its supporters. And that email may go to a million people. And if a million people tweet roughly the same thing within two hours of each other, that will look to outside people like a bot network. Hmm. But we're able to look at the internal signals and we're able to ascertain whether it is or it isn't. And oftentimes what we find is that it is organic. It is something where there are real human-directed uh, accounts at, uh, at play. Now, that's not to say that uh, 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 you know, uh, accounts uh, will have followers who are not uh, authentic. And that's certainly the case. We actually just made uh, a big sweep uh, through of a lot of the dormant uh, followers who were not active on the platform and removed them. And, and we do this routinely. So we're certainly going to continue that work to make sure that the account follower uh, indicators reflects authentic active accounts. Uh, we're going to continue to work going after the spam bots where we think we've made significant progress. Uh, but uh, the, the thing that we need to do is we need to work with outside academic researchers more closely to make sure that we can partner with them on research on Twitter where we can give them a clean data set because increasingly relying on the public signals will not be so accurate in part because we've changed our tactics. As I said a year ago, last September, we only challenged 3.2 million accounts a week. It's now close to 10 million accounts a week. So that gap is going to grow. Uh, right. And we recently uh, just announced, uh, uh, after a request for proposal, a couple of data uh, relationships with a couple of academic institutions in Europe to help assess and measure some of the health characteristics on Twitter in this way. And this is something we'd like to do uh, with greater frequency as we go forward, because we do believe we can gain some insight and some expertise working with outside academic researchers mm. that will help us. Got a call. Natalia is extremely trabalha né, na, in this é, uh, hubs academicos. Né? Você quer complementar essa questão? É, eu acho que acabou contemplando. Eu pensei numa questão nesse sentido de perguntar como esses estudos subsidiam ações, né, ou revisão de políticas da plataforma. É, e o que você aponta é de que deve haver um diálogo, né? É, mas então queria passar para um, um, um outro tópico que tem muito a ver ainda hum. com o contexto eleitoral, é, que são sobre notícias falsas, né? É, o Facebook ele tem feito parcerias com jornalistas, né, que trabalham com checagem de notícias para garantir qualidade das notícias na plataforma. É, no Twitter, algumas dessas iniciativas, como aos fatos, criaram ferramentas como o Fatima Bot, né, para apontar notícias falsas ou erradas. É, eu gostaria de entender se há outros tipos de parceria ou como o Twitter vai agir em relação a esse tema. E posso só meses. complementar a pergunta da Pode, Natália? Pode, por favor. Uhum. Uhum. 
Colin, só complementando... A, a Letícia vai complementar a pergunta. Só complementando a pergunta da Natália, o MIT, esse ano, lançou um estudo que mostra, estudou mais de 126 mil notícias e mostrou que é, as fake news, né, você tem a repercussão de 70% de chance maior de repercutir uma notícia falsa do que uma notícia verdadeira, né, estudando todas essas, essas notícias que foram veiculadas no Twitter. Então, isso mostra que é muito difícil vencer a batalha de fake news, né? E à medida que vocês têm feito um trabalho de desativar inúmeras contas, como é que a gente consegue vencer essa batalha à medida que o usuário também, ele pode ser desativado, mas amanhã ele cria uma conta nova? Como é que vocês pretendem vencer essa batalha do fake news? Okay, thank you. I'll answer Natalia's question first and then I'll come back and comment on that academic research. So one thing, uh, uh, we are working here in Brazil and so we have a relationship with Comprova, uh, which is doing some fact-checking work uh, in addition to other social media organizations with journalistic organizations. Uh, and we're also uh, providing some pro bono uh, advertising and promotion to make sure that their corrective, their corrections to Uh, inaccurate uh, content uh, is uh, shared. And so we are working here in Brazil to make sure that we can provide uh, some lift uh, and amplification of this uh, type of content to uh, provide the corrective in timely fashion uh, for uh, users on uh, Twitter. And Leticia uh, mentioned uh, some academic uh, studies uh, on this. Uh, the, the MIT study that you referenced where fake news will travel you know, five times faster than real news. One of the things to look at there is the methodology of what they were studying. And there were some initial uh, uh, reports on that uh, study that uh, the MIT researchers subsequently went, uh, uh, came back again to provide additional context because they felt that it was being misunderstood. In that particular study, what they looked at was fact-checked stories that were fake and fact-checked stories that were true. Now, it's hard to quantify the amount of true stories that are shared on Twitter every day by news organizations and journalists that are there. So it was only looking at fact-checked stories. And in particular, they were only looking at fact-checked fake stories that had been designed and had achieved virality that had already gone viral. So it was looking at a subset of a subset of a subset of these types of news stories. Now, certainly, uh, it's the case that if you are looking at stories that have already gone uh, viral, uh, you will see a natural uh, human dynamic sometimes where people will share uh, 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 false news and they'll share it uh, widely. Uh, the good news is that uh, Twitter is uh, open, it's public, it has lots of journalists. Journalists are, pro are providing this correction uh, in, in real time. Uh, But one of the things that we want to look at when we look at the totality of uh, news uh, and content on Twitter is to recognize that uh, if you look at the Oxford Internet Institute, which is another study, uh, it's 1% uh, of Twitter accounts engage in uh, that type of um, uh, uh, sensationalized or fabricated uh, content. Now, they provide a disproportionate amount of it, but the relative number of accounts that are doing it is relatively small. It remains the case that uh, uh, accurate uh, news from established journalists and established news organizations is the overwhelming majority of the content that people uh, see on Twitter. A Patricia quer fazer uma pergunta. Ainda sobre esse estudo do MIT, ele mostrou é, dessa, esse potencial de difusão da notícia não verídica ou da desinformação maior do que a notícia verídica. Mas ele trouxe um dado é, que mostra que não só essas notícias não só, não só são replicadas por robôs, mas sim pelo, é, pelo cidadão, pelo usuário. É, como envolver esse cidadão, esse usuário do Twitter nesse combate às notícias falsas ou essa proliferação de conteúdo danoso? Uh, it's a great question, uh, and um, uh, one of the things that, uh, since we're talking about MIT, uh, Patricia, uh, we're working very closely uh, with MIT. What uh, we announced earlier this year uh, in conjunction with uh, the MIT Media Lab uh, is uh, a health assessment, health criteria, uh, to measure uh, the conversation on Twitter and measure it over time and come up with metrics uh, to do that. 
uh, in headlong pursuit of figuring out how to have healthy conversations on Twitter. Uh, as you mentioned, not solely uh, being concerned about malicious automation, but general conversations from average users uh, there and how we think about uh, the prospect of civic conversation on the internet, but on Twitter over the long uh, haul. And the MIT uh, Media Lab uh, folks uh, suggested to us looking at uh, Twitter uh, conversations using four criteria. And we shared those criteria and we asked uh, users and we asked the public for uh, input and reaction uh, to these criteria. And just in brief, I'll tell you what they are. Uh, it's in, uh, I, I used to work previously in, in government, uh, but working for a tech company over seven years, I now understand that tech companies like to measure things and they like data. So if you think of the health of a human body, there are certain metrics that we use. Uh, you can take my temperature, uh, you can check my pulse rate, uh, my doctor can tell me what my cholesterol level is. All of those are metrics and data that give me an overall sense of my health. Uh, and if I have a high temperature, they'll know that something is off kilter and out of balance uh, with my health. So we're looking for metrics and criteria and the things to measure on Twitter that will give us a sense of health. And the four criteria they came up with was first, shared attention. Are we talking about issues in a community or in a country that uh, we mutually hold to be important issues? Are we talking about the right things? And that's a, a question of shared attention. The second was uh, shared reality. Are there facts that we mutually hold to be true? Uh, there's a saying uh, in English that uh, you could have your own opinions, uh, but you can't have your own facts. Mm -hmm. Well, in today's world, unfortunately, people want to have their own facts too. So the second criteria is about uh, shared reality. The third criteria is figuring out a way to measure uh, diversity of perspectives. Uh, are we seeing different viewpoints? And the final criteria is about receptivity. And that's about uh, once we're exposed to diverse viewpoints, are we open to them? Are we open to persuasion? And if we engage in a debate over those uh, views, is the nature of that debate, is the nature of that conversation uh, civil or is it toxic and poisonous? And so we asked the public first, uh, are these the right criteria to think about health of a Twitter conversation, of any conversation on the internet? Two, how would we measure them? What are the metrics? And then the third thing we did is we put out a request for proposal to academics and researchers where we offered access to Twitter data in exchange for helping us figure out how to measure the criteria. Because our goal would be to measure this over time. So, the, the changes in product and policy that we make, we can see whether they're making things better or making things worse, or perhaps making things better in some respects and worse in other respects. That's the only way we can gauge our progress uh, and to do that. So the question, Patricia, is a good one. How do we deal with you know, fake news? How do we deal with civility? How do we deal with uh, bullying? How do we deal with a generation uh, of children who are growing up uh, in this environment who are digital natives uh, and certainly are not having the childhood I had, uh, which was uh, uh, sitting in front of a television, uh, but are actively engaged in interactive media in, in a way. And so this is something that's very important to us as a company. It's important to me as a parent uh, to make sure that uh, we're bringing everybody together, including civil society, public interest groups, academic institutions to help us uh, measure and make progress over time. Fernanda. Eu, eu, é, a gente tem um dito popular no Brasil que fala que de boa intenção o inferno está cheio. E eu acho super legais as boas intenções, mas a, o contexto real do Brasil é que a gente tem uma população com muito baixo acesso à educação. É, tem muita gente que é analfabeto, semi-analfabeto. É, e que quando você fala, ah, quando a gente é, filtra as notícias é porque a gente verifica a fonte da notícia, a conta é verificada ou não é verificada. Nós temos uma geração, uma onda de usuários de Twitter que não sabem o que significa o, o verified e, e não dá para explicar para eles. Os nossos eleitores não sabem o que é o fundo partidário. É, e tem um dos candidatos falando que está campanhando sem usar o fundo partidário. Eles não sabem o que é. Então, no contexto Brasil, na nossa realidade, 
que é, nesse sentido, bastante diferente da americana, qual é a atitude, quais são as atitudes reais que o Twitter pode tomar para realmente ajudar a gente, não só a não difusão de fake news mas a, e proliferação de fake news, mas também a não difusão de é, é, pessoas que vão instigar é, cidadãos e, e, e constituintes a tomarem atitudes e que não são robôs, eles não são bots, eles são trolls, tem muito troll no Brasil. E quando a gente fala de malicious, malicious automation, não é esse o nosso problema no Brasil. O nosso problema no Brasil é que o brasileiro não sabe ler e escrever, o brasileiro não tem acesso à educação e ele vai ler em 280 caracteres alguma coisa e pode ser que ele acredite. Ou, pior do que isso, alguém num programa sensacionalista na internet vai ler um tweet sensacionalista, vai botar no YouTube ou vai botar num live no Facebook e aquela pessoa vai acreditar. Então, não adianta só usar tecnologia no Brasil. Nós não somos os Estados Unidos. Como que o Twitter pode nos ajudar? Thank you, Fernanda. I appreciate the question. And uh, I love the question in part because it brings together all different aspects of technology, uh, public policy uh, as well. And uh, that intersection is where we live. And so, certainly for Twitter's part, We want to make sure that we do a better job at making uh, it clear to users uh, what the rules are, how Twitter works, uh, to be informed about our policies and practices. And there's certainly room for improvement uh, there. And uh, we're uh, alive to that uh, issue. And we will make sure that we're doing uh, ever more uh, uh, sharing of information and transparency around our processes so people are clear about them in a way that also builds trust uh, that we're doing it uh, with uh, the, the best of intentions regardless of the route we may be on. Uh, the second uh, issue that you mentioned uh, is with respect to the user base. Uh, and certainly, uh, if you look at uh, what I mentioned before with respect to conduct and civility on the platform, in one respect, I don't think uh, users in Brazil or parents in Brazil are any different from parents anywhere else in their aspirations for their children. Uh, and certainly, it is uh, something that Twitter as a company can contribute to a process uh, where we can be of uh, assistance. Twitter can be a ve vehicle for education. Twitter can be a vehicle for sharing healthy, nutritious information about media literacy, about digital literacy, about bullying uh, in schools, about the media literacy that gives a sixth, seventh, and eighth grader a sense of perspective about what are information sources on the internet that they can trust, what are uh, information sources that perhaps they should be skeptical about. Uh, but this is something that's going to involve not just Twitter, uh, but it's going to involve government. Government has a role in, its, in the education system uh, in making sure that there is a digital curriculum uh, for school kids uh, uh, in Brazil in the same way that uh, this should be something that is uh, prevalent in any country Uh, in, the, in the, the time we're living in, which is highly digitized and ever more digitized for the youth uh, that uh, have access to these technologies. But there's also a, a, a role for civil society and public interest groups who can help shape the policies in government, who could work with uh, tech companies like Twitter to develop the course curricula uh, for schools, who can have after-school programs, perhaps, that engage in this, who can make publicly available through Twitter Uh, media literacy uh, information and news literacy uh, information so that it's readily available where the people are, where the children are, which is increasingly on their, uh, on their phones. And obviously, there's a role for all of us as citizens and uh, as, uh, as parents with respect to the ne next generation. So I think we're all in this together. We understand the difficulty of the, uh, uh, the current age. Uh, but uh, with peril, uh, there also comes promise. Uh, and technology can be very powerful as a way of elevating society, bringing society together. And that is certainly the process that we would like to be involved with uh, here in Brazil. Uh, a gente vai para mais um intervalo. Voltamos com o vice-presidente de políticas públicas globais do Twitter, Colin Crowell, em instantes. Espere aí, voltamos já já. Estamos de volta para o terceiro bloco da entrevista com o vice-presidente de Políticas Públicas Globais do Twitter, Callen Crowell. Vamos começar agora com a pergunta do Juliano Spire. 
Uh, Colin, hoje, além dos principais candidatos que estão concorrendo a, aos maiores cargos, você tem um grande número de candidatos a cargos menores. É, e no contexto que a gente vive hoje, surgiram no Brasil, uma das novidades dessa eleição são movimentos de renovação política, que tentam trazer para a política pessoas que não são políticos profissionais. É, existem aí plataformas diferentes, como Facebook, como Twitter, como WhatsApp, com públicos e funcionamentos diferentes. É, por que, que esses candidatos novos, que têm pouco acesso ao jornalismo, aos grandes jornais, à TV, etc., por que, que eles escolheriam o Twitter em relação a esses outros, é, essas outras plataformas? Well, I think, uh, Giuliano, the reason is that Twitter is uh, so wildly open and public. Uh, and uh, certainly one of the things that uh, I love about Twitter is that it does allow uh, for people uh, who might have historically been less powerful voices in a society, historically marginalized voices in society, uh, to reach an audience and break into a local, national, or global conversation. And we see this unfold on Twitter uh, all the time. Uh, in a previous era, uh, an African-American uh, being uh, shot in Ferguson, Missouri, might not have gotten uh, national coverage. But on Twitter, uh, it was able to be covered, and uh, the conversation became significant. And out of Black Lives Matter, uh, a movement is born about raising the consciousness Uh, about this uh, about this issue. We see it in the Me Too movement. Uh, you can see people from all walks of life, from all sorts of experiences, have the ability to go to a platform and be heard and, and, and share that. So you don't have to be the most powerful person. Uh, you don't have to be an established uh, 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 person. You can be an average user and get access uh, to an audience and to share your view and your perspective. And we value that uh, on Twitter. We've seen that here in Brazil Uh, too, where uh, people bring uh, to the national uh, conversation issues that they feel are important to them. So if you look at uh, something that uh, you know, went you know, beyond Brazil with uh, uh, Deixa Ela Trabalhar, right? That's an issue where uh, people wanted to bring their perspective, their very uh, strongly held views about conduct in society, and that's how societies can advance. That's how societies can uh, understand uh, the aspirations for, for all of its people to move forward. And Twitter is a vehicle uh, for sharing that, regardless of your station uh, in life. Carlos, posso, posso fazer uh, uma... Só, só, só uma coisa, eu já, já devolvo para você. Uma curiosidade, quais países que usam mais o Twitter? Qual é o ranking de uso do Twitter? I, I won't have an accurate uh, list for you. Certainly, Brazil is, is high on that list, and Twitter continues to grow uh, in Brazil. One of, the, one of the vectors for growth uh, uh, for Twitter is whenever there is a national conversation. Uh, and Brazil, over the last several years, has had the World Cup, uh, the Olympics, Uh, and a presidential election. And certainly uh, that's something that drives a lot of conversation and uh, a lot of uh, sign-ups for Twitter. Uh, but there are, there are countries in the world that have um, uh, high, high penetrations uh, of Twitter. It would be the ones that you would expect. Uh, but I think one of the things to uh, uh, share here is that uh, even though Twitter was born in San Francisco, uh, 80% of Twitter users are now outside of the United States. And so we really are a global company, and we really do see these global conversations occur uh, all the time now. Então, a resposta que, que você deu, ela faz muito sentido genericamente para mídias sociais, ou seja, as pessoas podem usar essas plataformas, mas, por exemplo, se, muito sinteticamente, se a gente pensa na audiência que um candidato novo pode ter no Facebook, aqui no Brasil, que é por volta de 170 milhões de usuários, ela é significantemente maior do que ela teria no Twitter. Então, eu estava querendo saber por que o Twitter seria um veículo para esse candidato abraçar com uma maneira dele promover seus valores, campanhas, ideias, etc. Eu 
I think the reason is uh, because Twitter is open and public. Twitter is fast. It's instantaneous. Twitter is also, uh, because it's open and public and it's fast, tends to be where news breaks. And people go to Twitter to find out what's happening and what's happening right now here in my community. And because that's the case, Twitter is also a place where lots of journalists uh, exist. Lots of news media organizations are there. So it is a very powerful place, though it is smaller perhaps than other uh, social media uh, behemoths, where if you're trying to reach the public, if you're trying to be in an open conversation, if you're trying to share your views and perspectives about something that's happening right now, Twitter's the place to go. Letícia. Colin, eu queria mudar um pouco é, o rumo da conversa e, e falar um pouco sobre como que o Twitter pode ser utilizado também para construir soluções junto ao setor público. No Brasil, agora, recentemente, a gente começou uma discussão de agenda digital, como que o Brasil pode se tornar um país mais digital e mais inovador. O Brasil Lab, por exemplo, é uma organização que conecta startups com o poder público. A gente tenta levar soluções para dentro do governo. Então, minha pergunta é se o Twitter já foi utilizado como uma ferramenta para a construção de alguma solução junto ao setor público e quais foram os resultados. Uh, thanks for the question, Leticia. The short answer is yes, uh, but let me give you some examples. Uh, here in Brazil, uh, from last year, we had uh, a direct message uh, integration with the Brazilian Electoral Commission, where Twitter users could interact with the Electoral Commission and get information uh, of interest to voters. Uh, about the voting process here in Brazil. In other countries, we've had integrations with government agencies and ministries that provide almost like a consumer response uh, dashboard. So uh, in India, we have uh, something which is called Twitter Seva in India. Seva is Hindi for service. And uh, government ministries will receive complaints. They'll see, receive requests for information from the public, and then they're able to respond directly through Twitter uh, to uh, citizen uh, issues. And that responsiveness is something that they can do uh, through Twitter. We have a similar uh, integration with ministries in, in Indonesia. Uh, we also have uh, done something with the Australian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs to provide through uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Twitter account information of relevance for Australians who are traveling abroad. Uh, uh, of information that may be relevant for, uh, for them as they, uh, as they travel. Uh, we have uh, in uh, London uh, a transportation uh, authority with uh, use the Twitter app to talk about delays on the tube uh, for commuters so that they can modify their route to work based upon information that they receive uh, through, through Twitter. And so the transportation authority is doing that as a public service. Uh, seria bem útil em São Paulo, né? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, having traveled in uh, São Paulo traffic, I understand the value <laughs> of integrating with perhaps the transportation <laughs> ministry. Uh, and so maybe that should be our first. That should be our first integration. But I want to give you another uh, anecdote and a story uh, about uh, a little village in Spain, and the village is called Hun. And it has 3,500 uh, inhabitants, so it's relatively small. Uh, but uh, uh, Alcalde Jose Antonio, who's the mayor of Hoon, has convinced the citizens of Hoon over time to all get Twitter accounts. And he essentially runs the government services of the town on Twitter. And it provides a response to citizens to reach him, to reach uh, members of the city uh, council, the town council. Uh, but also it brings transparency and accountability uh, to government services. So an example of what they do is if uh, a, t a citizen tweets to the mayor that the street lamp is out on their street, they take a picture of the street lamp and they tag the mayor in the tweet. The mayor then receives that notification that there's a street lamp out on this street and he adds uh, the person in Hoon who's in charge of fixing street lamps. And so that person now knows that uh, they've gotten a request to fix the lamp, and so uh, that person goes to work. When he's fixed the lamp, he takes a picture of it and says, uh, job done, the lamp uh, is fixed. Now the benefit of that is everybody in the town can see that. 
And so the mayor and his staff is accountable to the town. There's transparency about what the government is doing. But almost every aspect of the village life is on uh, Twitter in this way. And so the police all have Twitter accounts. Uh, and they respond through community policing on, on that. Uh, social services uh, are, are on Twitter. Now the question is, how do you take a village of 3,500 and extrapolate that out to larger communities and larger societies? And it won't be easy, uh, but sometimes it takes a village uh, to build a larger community. It takes a village to show the way. Uh, and I think there are lessons here uh, you know, for all of us, because it might not be something that you do on a grand scale uh, with uh, multiple million uh, inhabitants in a particular community, but maybe you start with uh, a particular ministry. You start with a particular discipline, like transportation, like social services, education, and try certain things and experiment with them, because it is the ability to provide open public transparency and accountability in service where the government can show it's discharging its responsibilities and the public can judge whether or not they're doing a good job or not. Patrícia, a gente tem tempo para uma pergunta rápida. Rapidamente. Só queria voltar no tema eleições. É, pela primeira vez, a justiça eleitoral permitiu é, o patrocínio de publicações via redes sociais. E o Twitter decidiu não é, não fazer, não entrar, autorizar esse, esses patrocínios. Qual foi o motivo? Vocês têm uma visão de que isso poderia influenciar negativamente os resultados das eleições? Uh, thank you, Patricia. It's, it's not because we thought it would influence uh, negatively uh, anything. The conversation around the elections on Twitter is going to be robust and, and quite large regardless of whether we accept advertising uh, or not. We decided that uh, because Brazil has requirements with respect to transparency around political advertising, that we wanted to do this in the best way and build uh, a mechanism where we could provide that opportunity uh, for uh, advertisers, political advertisers, to fulfill that responsibility under, uh, under Brazilian law. We didn't think we could build that facility in time in order to do it, and so we decided on our own that we would simply not have uh, advertising this time. The next Brazilian election, uh, I'm sure we will, uh, and we're building a transparency center that we will take uh, globally. But it's simply uh, a situation now where we're deciding on our own that we don't want to accept this type of advertising. Brazil will not be the first country that we make this decision in. We've made this decision in other countries uh, as well uh, previously. A gente vai para mais um rápido intervalo. Voltamos com o vice-presidente de políticas públicas globais do Twitter, Kalen Crowell. Fica aí, nós voltamos num ótimo. <música> Estamos de volta para o quarto e último bloco da entrevista com o vice-presidente de Políticas Públicas Globais do Twitter, Kalen Crowell. Kalen, uma curiosidade. Eu sei que os brasileiros, por exemplo, quando vão para o Google, eles têm uma característica. No Twitter também o público brasileiro tem uma característica? It's a good question, Ricardo. I don't know uh, the particular demographic uh, uh, characteristics of uh, Brazilians. I know anecdotally, uh, and uh, I think this show is probably an evidence of, of that, is that uh, Brazilians like to share uh, and like to uh, comment uh, and like to engage in, in conversations. And so uh, it's uh, certainly a, a market that for Twitter, uh, we do see growth, uh, I think, in, in part because of that. Okay. Natalia. Bom, eu acho que eu queria voltar ao tema que a gente discutiu um pouco no primeiro bloco sobre liberdade de expressão e violência, que foi muito explorado pela Fernanda, é, num, num outro sentido, talvez, da violência como uma forma de autocensura. Né? Então, enquanto pesquisador, enquanto alguém que é ativista também no campo de direitos humanos, é, sempre me chega notícias de pessoas que, por terem sofrido violência na plataforma, desativaram contas por, por si mesmas, né? não porque foram banidas, mas por conta do medo, da insegurança, enfim. É, 
tem um caso emblemático mesmo de 2016, da, da atriz, né, Lelis Jones, que também sofreu muitos ataques racistas na plataforma e acabou optando por sair é, do espaço. E a minha pergunta seria no sentido de que, bom, dados sobre a nossa identidade de raça, sexualidade, gênero, são coletados pela plataforma, né? Eu gostaria de saber se a análise, é, baseada nos perfis das pessoas, é, com base nas identidades, e se sim, se é observado algum tipo de desigualdade. Já que a preocupação da plataforma é garantir que o ambiente seja diverso, eu gostaria de entender se há é, uma preocupação em entender o perfil desse usuário é, nesse sentido. Uh, thank you, Natalia. Uh, this is an issue which is very serious, and so we want to make sure that we're taking any threats of violence uh, to users on the platform with great seriousness, and that we're acting uh, in accordance with the values that I think we all share with respect to such threats. Uh, Twitter's safety policies, as I mentioned uh, earlier, have uh, evolved over time, but in particular, they've evolved most and most rapidly in the last year. So in the last year, we've made some 25 different modifications to the product and to our policies around safety uh, issues. Uh, direct threats of violence uh, uh, at an individual uh, also takes into account threats of violence to a group or a class uh, of individuals, of protected categories of minorities, LGBT uh, users, uh, and the like. And so we take those uh, threats seriously. Uh, in, in communal violence uh, contexts. Uh, the result of some 25 to 30 different changes in product and policy around safety means that today we're actioning 10 times more accounts for safety violations than we were one year ago. And so we hope that people over time will see the improvement uh, uh, that we're bringing to this. But diversity uh, and equality is very important to us. Equality is one of the things that we work on in our corporate uh, philanthropy program because we believe as a company in the dignity of every human being. One of the things that uh, is very special to me uh, coming from the United States is that uh, so-called black Twitter uh, over indexes on Twitter compared to other social media with participation from African Americans and it has its own unique culture uh, on Twitter where they can celebrate aspects uh, of their lived experience and of the culture uh, that uh, is uh, wonderful for every Twitter user uh, to see. So we cherish the diversity, we see the diversity here in Brazil uh, and we want to make sure that uh, that diversity is not only uh, protected uh, but celebrated. Uh, last November, for example, uh, Twitter had an emoji uh, for uh, Negras Vidas as part of a uh, program around black consciousness here in Brazil uh, that we worked on with the United Nations. And there was an emoji where people in Brazil could tweet uh, with respect uh, to uh, that experience and those issues that are relevant to the community uh, in, in celebration of that uh, diversity. So it is very important to us. Fernanda. Eu vou mudar de assunto. E quando, antes de vir para cá, eu, eu dei uma investigada em você. E eu te contei lá fora que eu percebi que você tem uma carreira em public service nos Estados Unidos. Você trabalhou, foi assessor de algumas pessoas, alguns políticos importantes, se envolveu no FCC, no, no Broadband Act. E, e, e você falou que agora você vai comemorar sete anos de Twitter. Então, realmente, pelo jeito, você vai ficando. Então, eu queria saber de você, uma pessoa que tem que construiu a vida profissional, e provavelmente foi isso que te levou para o Twitter, em public service, né? em, 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 em servir ao público, é, como que você gostaria, porque para mim o seu, o seu, o seu, a sua área é a mais importante do Twitter hoje, dadas, o dado que está acontecendo no mundo e como o Twitter está sendo mal utilizado. O que, que você quer para o Twitter? Como você gostaria de ver o Twitter funcionando nos próximos anos? para realmente ser mais saudável a conversa, para realmente ser mais construtiva a conversa. E eu, pessoalmente, acho que, se for, vocês vão, inclusive, ver valor na, no valor de mercado, nas ações, porque acho que as pessoas, é, o, o mercado todo vai valorizar, os anunciantes vão, vão vir mais. Então, que, como você enxerga isso? Uh, well, Fernando, uh, Fernanda, thank you for invoking my previous life. Uh, I, I did have a, a previous career in government service, and I very felt uh, uh, throughout that experience to be very public interest uh, oriented. I came to Twitter because uh, of my interest in public service and the public interest, because as I mentioned before, I do see Twitter as a vehicle where 
uh, everybody can express themselves, that free expression uh, is something that we revere uh, and try to protect. And I also see Twitter as uh, the place uh, where historically marginalized, historically less powerful voices can be present uh, in the media mix uh, in a way uh, that would have been a dream uh, to people a generation or two ago. And that's very powerful. And I do believe that uh, the prospect that that kind of sharing of uh, human perspectives across cultures, across countries, can bring the world uh, together. And so that is my aspiration for Twitter, uh, that it serves as a vehicle that brings people together, that it ce celebrates human endeavors in its broad, uh, broadest uh, context, uh, and that uh, if we look back uh, 10 years uh, from now, uh, that we've created a platform that is the most open, uh, the most healthy, the most responsive, the most informative, uh, and uh, the most likely to help advance human society. Uh, Patrícia pediu para realmente ser tipo é. Twitter mesmo. O nosso desafio aqui é combater a proliferação da desinformação, do discurso do ódio, das, das fake news, sem restringir a liberdade de expressão. Media literacy é a solução? What we do is we try to strike a balance. Our, our uh, a strong uh, bias is towards free expression. Uh, but there is content uh, in any open uh, platform, in any community uh, that uh, has uh, free expression as a guiding principle that is not acceptable. Uh, and so whether it's on Twitter or it's in the public square in real life, there is certain conduct and certain uh, uh, speech that would not be uh, permitted or not be acceptable depending on the context. And so uh, we do uh, go after uh, those uh, types of behaviors that would manipulate the platform, warp it and twist it into ways that would lead to deception and misleading uh, conduct. Uh, but we do believe uh, ultimately uh, that uh, the ability to people to express themselves and have the community, to have journalists, to have news organizations debate, to expose, to scrutinize, uh, to validate, to refute uh, content on the platform uh, serves the public conversation. And we don't believe with respect to uh, uh, that con uh, content that a corporation is the best suited to decide in any society what is uh, uh, truthful or, or untruthful, particularly when you get to political speech, uh, which is the most precious and important uh, speech in any society. Letícia. Queria aproveitar o gancho da Fernanda, falar sobre a sua experiência de mais de 20 anos no Congresso americano e agora à frente do Twitter e falar sobre regulação. Então, é claro que a gente precisa de novas leis que possam traduzir os desafios da sociedade moderna, mas eu queria te perguntar, como que a gente pode fazer com que essa regulação não seja interpretada como uma censura também, ao mesmo tempo? É uma grande pergunta, e eu acho que uma que muitas sociedades, muitos governos, grupos públicos e empresas estão se empregando agora. Uh, here in Brazil, several years ago, uh, Brazil passed the Marco Civil. And the Marco Civil provided a framework uh, that provided the intermediary uh, liability protections and uh, also had uh, net neutrality rules to protect the openness uh, of the internet in Brazil. And that openness is something uh, that provides opportunities for entrepreneurs, uh, for entrepreneurial activity and investment and innovation, but also provides that openness that is indispensable uh, to free expression and people being able to express themselves uh, in various contexts uh, on the internet, whether it's Twitter or any other platform uh, here in Br Brazil. So those foundational uh, principles enshrined in law and that type of regulation can be very healthy. Uh, Brazil is also poised uh, right now to provide protections uh, around consumer privacy. Uh, consumer privacy is something we feel very strongly uh, about at Twitter and have uh, many protections that we put in place uh, for our users. Uh, and this is something that also, uh, as that uh, legislation and that proposal becomes uh, law and moves through the final stages of the process, that we're eager to work with uh, government and all stakeholders to make sure that it's done well in service of consumers, uh, which should be the focal point uh, of that. But certainly there will be other proposals for regulations. There will be other proposals uh, with respect to content 
uh, on social media, on the internet generally, uh, that will want to engage with government, but also want to engage with consumer groups, public interest groups, to make sure that we get the policies correct. Because if we get this policy correct around communications policy, it can help animate smart policies in the energy sector and social services and education and everywhere else. Uh, so uh, Twitter stands to be a close partner uh, with uh, civil society groups and with government to help fashion the policies that make sense for the internet era. Juliana. Se essa conversa tivesse no Twitter e a gente usasse hashtags, provavelmente jornalismo seria uma hashtag importante e estaria nos trending topics. E, no entanto, a gente vê hoje no Brasil, eu imagino que seja também o contexto nos Estados Unidos, as empresas de jornalismo diminuindo e perdendo é, poder financeiro e perdendo, portanto, sua influência na sociedade. De que maneira que o Twitter promove o jornalismo institucionalmente e qual que é a sua visão para o futuro do jornalismo é, no mundo e, particularmente, talvez nos Estados Unidos? Uh, this is something that we certainly want to do. Uh, we don't believe that we compete uh, with journalism. We believe we complement journalism. We believe we become a vehicle to share great journalism. And in many respects, in many parts of the world, we're seeing a new golden age of high quality journalism. Our job is to work in partnership with journalists and, and news media organizations so that they can reach uh, people who want to read and see their content. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're doing an ever better job uh, going forward to make sure that we're amplifying and augmenting high quality journalism because we believe we can reinforce uh, the value that journalism and journalists play uh, by using that, this open public platform. Colin, uh, agora eu queria uh, respostas muito rápidas, uh, muito curtas, menos do que no Twitter. Você tem um ídolo? Um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I uh, uh, revere uh, leaders uh, who provide context around the decisions that uh, they make. And so one of the, one of the leaders that uh, I worked for in government is a senator uh, in the United States Congress. And so he's one of the people I most admire, is my Quem? former boss. Quem é? Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts. Okay. E a qual música que está no seu top da, da sua lista de músicas, na sua playlist? My preferred song? Um, it's, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I'm trying to think of a Brazilian one for you. <laughs> Não, eu quero uma verdadeira. <laughs> uh, it, it, a year ago, it would have been Despacito, but... Uh... <laughs> e um livro que você recomende? Uh, a book that I would recommend uh, uh, to be read uh, would be, uh, I think, for people who want to understand uh, the uh, American experience, Huckleberry Finn is often a book that explains our society in a, in a particular way. Uh, but I think a book uh, that I have found uh, over time uh, to be uh, 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 one that I uh, particularly like is a, is a uh, book called Owen Meany. Uh, which is a book uh, by um, uh, an author who was popular probably about two decades ago. Uh, but that's one that I would recommend. By old author? It's, it's uh, the, I'm, I'm now blanking on the, uh, on okay. the author of it. Okay. Você tem uma frase, um verso assim que seja importante para sua vida? Uh, you know, the, the public policy team at Twitter, we're uh, uh, spread around the world. Uh, we have our own team hashtag, uh, which came from uh, one of our colleagues who is in Ireland. He's based in Dublin. Uh, and he used to use this saying when he signed off on uh, emails uh, to the broader public policy team. And it's, it's a saying that's in Irish. Uh, and in Irish, it's uh, berbua. And it's the hashtag berbua. And berbua in Irish translates into English uh, as deserve victory. Uh, and I like that saying for the team because if we do our work, if we do it to a high level of excellence, then we'll deserve the victory in whatever we're working on. Muito obrigado, Colin. 
Estamos chegando ao final de mais essa edição do Roda Viva. Eu agradeço a participação da Fernanda Romano, da Natália Neres, da Letícia Picoloto, da Patrícia Blanco, do Juliano Spire e do nosso cartunista intraduzível Paulo Caruso. Agradeço também a você que nos acompanhou até agora, especialmente ao nosso entrevistado Colin Crowell. Boa noite, boa semana a todos e até a próxima segunda. Até. Música